Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Since 9-11 Virtual Student Summit today, which is Human Rights Day. Today's event is brought to you by the charity Since 9-11 in partnership with UCL Institute of Education. There are more than 8,000 secondary school students watching along with you from hundreds of schools all across the UK. It's great to have you all here. I know that many of you won't have ever seen those terrible, horrific scenes of the 9-11 terrorist attacks that happened in America on the 11th of September, 2001, although you may well know about the other four terrorist attacks shown in the video, the last three of which all happened since 2017. My name is Lily Rosengard, and I am a human rights advocate. I will be your host this morning. Of course, none of you students watching now was alive when 9-11 took place. But your parents, family members, your teachers, all remember exactly where they were that day and will never forget it. It was the worst terrorist attack in history. The day the world changed. You've all grown up in a different world, a since 9-11 world. I was only six years old on that day, almost 20 years ago. It was my first day back at school after the summer holidays. It was a sunny day, there was a blue sky, very similar to the sky in New York that morning. I remember it was unusual because my parents both came to collect me to take me home from school. They didn't let me watch TV for a few days. My parents just said that something bad had happened in America and that a lot of innocent people had died. Later, I found out that these innocent people were the 2,977 victims of the Al-Qaeda Islamic terrorist attacks. Since 9-11 is an educational charity that has worked together with the UCL's Institute of Education, ranked number one in the world, to develop free educational resources for schools available for your teachers to download at the Since 9-11 website. These resources have been created so that you can learn about the events, the causes and consequences of 9-11 which will help you to understand not only how the world, your world, changed on 9-11, but very importantly, why it's relevant to you today and why you should care. And whilst the majority of attacks have been Islamist terrorism, committed, for example, by followers of the terrorist group ISIS, also known as ISIL, who have killed many thousands of people across the world, from all religions, including many thousands of Muslims in the Middle East. More recently, we have seen a rise in extremist right-wing white supremacist terrorism, as you saw in the video, with the attacks on the synagogue in Pittsburgh, USA, and at the mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, and a huge number of terrorist attacks in Afghanistan and Syria in 2000 alone. These are just a few examples. Since 9-11's aim is that through education, we can ensure there won't be similar atrocities in the future. Now, I know it's a dark and difficult subject, but we're here today to discuss these topics, to make them more accessible and approachable, so you can start to have these conversations in the classroom or with family and friends. The topic isn't something to be scared of. In fact, it's completely normal if you feel that way. That's why we're here today, to help you think it through, to be aware of the impacts of events such as 9-11 on your world, so we can learn from it for a better world for the future. Therefore, our goal today and for since 9-11 overall is to equip you with this knowledge so that you can challenge radicalization and extremism when you see or experience it from whatever source so that you and future generations from the years to come will inherit a more peaceful, a more harmonious, and a more tolerant world. One where everyone has respect for people of all faiths and religions. 
Over the next half hour, you're going to hear from four excellent expert speakers. And then for the remaining 15 minutes, you'll have an opportunity to ask them your questions. Our first speaker today is Nikki Napier, who is living in New Jersey in America with her then husband, Alex, and her three young children. Alex, who worked at the top of the World Trade Center, lost his life that day. Nikki worked as a primary teacher prior to moving to the US and has since worked in a Sure Start Center and has volunteered to support struggling families with preschool children through the charity Home Start. We will now watch a short video clip to hear from Nikki herself. My husband Alex left for work soon after 5 a.m. on September 11th, 2001. I slept on and woke to my 7 a.m. alarm and like all parents with young children, went into automatic mode, finding school uniforms, helping my four-year-old with dressing, putting breakfast on the table and clearing up the new puppy's mess from the carpet. Driving to school, we listened to a Manhattan-based radio station, WPLJ, Scott and Todd in the morning, as we sang along with their song choices. Having dropped the children at school, I stopped off to pick up carpet cleaner before setting off to meet a friend for coffee. When I returned to the car and started the engine, I sat completely frozen and numb as I listened to Scott and Todd describe the scene as they watched with incredulity as a plane went into the North Tower. I grabbed my mobile and called Alex's cell phone, no response, and then his landline, again, no response. The voices on the radio then became increasingly urgent as they described a second plane going into the South Tower. This was where Alex worked, on the top floor. In total panic, I decided to continue my seven mile journey to meet my friend. On seeing Charlotte, I crumpled. She drove me home where neighbors and friends were waiting. Like the majority of families who lost loved ones in the attacks, the only reason we knew they, they were killed was that they didn't come home. A few fragments of Alex's remains were identified two years later, by which time I'd moved back to the UK and started to build a new life for myself and my children. I'm forever grateful to all the many friends of ours in America who gave us strength and the will to go on at a time when we felt isolated from family members who were stuck in the UK. Friends who searched all the hospitals in the tri-state area and made missing leaflets, which they posted around Manhattan. Friends who catered for our every practical need, providing food, laundering clothes, providing fun activities for my children, taking care of any repairs to my home that needed addressing, and sitting up into the small hours with me, drinking wine, offering love, and sometimes even laughter. An unseen community of concern mobilized, enabling me to spend time with my three young children. Through our experience of 9-11, we've experienced the worst of life, but also the best of life. I hope that through the gift of appropriate education from an early age, children can grow up knowing the value of tolerance and understanding sameness and difference, and the power of community, friendship and inclusion. At the memorial service we had for Alex in America a few weeks after the attack, I asked a close American friend to say something. I want to share with you a few of Dan's words, which I think speak eloquently of the wider picture. Dan said, said during his uh, speech, he said, two weeks ago yesterday, I went to Jersey City with my friend Steve on a search for Alex's car. Alex's friend Tom had given me his best guess as to where the car might be. So Steve and I headed straight to Exchange Place late at night, September 13th. We quickly found the first garage on our list, took the elevator to the top floor and began the long walk down. On the top floor, there were no cars, as you would expect, on a Thursday night at 11 o'clock. But as we worked our way down, each floor had a few more cars. Fifth floor, six cars. Fourth floor, 25 cars. Third floor, 45 cars. 
By then, we knew what we were looking at. The lower the floor, the earlier they got to work, and each car still parked and still waiting to be driven home represented another grieving family, countless sorrowful friends. Thank you, Nikki. That can't have been easy to talk about, and we really appreciate you sharing your story. It really reminds us that terrorism is not just a news story, but that it has impact on real families and communities. Really looking forward to having Nikki on the panel with us a bit later. Next, we have Sara Khan to talk about countering extremism through education. Sara Khan was appointed by the Home Secretary to lead the newly created Commission for Countering Extremism. She's Britain's first counter extremism commissioner and she advises the government on policies, approaches and tools needed to effectively counter extremism. Prior to her role as commissioner, Sara was co-founder and co-director of Inspire, an independent non-governmental counter extremism and human rights organization and is also co-author of the book, The Battle for British Islam, Reclaiming Muslim Identity from Extremism. Sara, it's brilliant to have you with us. Thank you, Lily, uh, for introducing me and thank you to, to Nikki for sharing your really moving story with all of us. Like Lily, I certainly still remember the terrible events of that day almost 20 years ago, just like yesterday. And if you ask me about any other day 20 years ago, I can't remember it. And I think that's what's so striking about the reality of terrorism. You don't forget the horror of it. And terrorism is one of the consequences of extremism. And sadly, there are others. The Holocaust, genocides such as the Rwandan genocide, or at acts of ethnic cleansing, as we saw in Bosnia. These are all horrific acts of violence and death because of extremism. And what we learn from all of these terrible incidences is how at the root of extremism is fundamentally a hatred of the other. Now, we often overuse the word hatred, don't we? For example, yesterday, my 11-year-old shouted at me, I hate you, mummy just because I didn't extend her Wi-Fi time, Wi-Fi time. And I'm sure there are some of you who can probably relate to my daughter. Now, obviously, that's not the type of hatred I'm talking about. I'm talking about an extreme form of hatred when we dehumanize other human beings, where our hatred is so extreme, we condone or justify violence against another group of people on the basis of their race or religion or gender or political worldviews. And that's why education is so important. In fact, I think it's one of the most important tools to prevent extremism, to learn, for example, that extremism is not confined to a single race, religion, ideology, or a group of people. It's tempting to suggest that it's about a particular religion or group of people, but this is simply not the case. History will testify that extremism is a human and societal ill which emerges in all kinds of different societies. So in my role as commissioner, I've written and seen about far-right extremism, Islamist extremism, Sikh extremism, Hindu extremism, Christian extremism, left-wing extremism, animal rights extremism, and so on. And I think this is a really important notion we have to understand. But learning about equality and human rights on Human Rights Day is also key. When I started working in the field of counter extremism, one of the things that really struck me was how extremists seek to erode and undermine human rights and, and equality. Instead of marveling how diverse the human race is, how diversity strengthens us, extremists despise it, they fear it, and they seek to do away with difference. So I've seen how far right extremists promote hostility against ethnic minorities, Jews, Muslims. I've seen how Islamist extremists promote hatred towards gay people or to women or to Jews or to indeed to other Muslims as the video showed earlier on, which is why learning about human rights and equality is so critical. Now, I never had any lessons on extremism when I was at school, but I did learn about the importance of equality and how we as humans, despite our differences, are fundamentally the same. And when I was at secondary school all those years ago, it was the words of Shylock and William Shakespeare's A Merchant of Venice that some of you may be learning about at the moment. 
that left a particularly lasting impression on me. And I'm sure many of you will know the famous words when Shylock says, I am a Jew, hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And that notion of equality is something that certainly had an impact on me and I think helped shape my interest in counter-extremism. I just want to end by saying we all have a responsibility to challenge and to stand up and to speak out against extremism. We all have a role to play. So in my role, I tell the government what they should be doing and not doing. I tell social media companies about the, the role they play. I even tell faith leaders about the important job they have in countering extremism. But what matters ultimately is all of us. We have friends, we have family members who sometimes may say hateful extremist things about other people. And we should gently tell them that this is wrong. And don't underestimate the power of one voice speaking out. Your voice matters and can make all the difference. And let me give you a really quick example. I spoke to a man last year who told me that he found out that a big far-right extremist rally was going to be organised in his hometown and that some of his mates were going to go. He then sat down with them and convinced them that this was, was not the right approach. And because of him, his mates didn't go and the rally, in the end, got cancelled. And that's the power of one individual, one voice, and we can all make a difference. I just want to end with a final quote. It's a quote that for me anyway, sums up what I think countering extremism is really about. And it's by Albert Einstein. And he said, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. And sadly, like crime and criminals, there will always be extremists in our society. But it's what we do that ultimately matters. And what I do know is that inaction in the face of extremism can never be the response. Thank you. I'm just handing back to you, Lily. Thanks, Sarah, for really bringing the focus from large acts of terrorism to everyday experiences of hate speech, Islamophobia, hate crime, and how this can be challenged. And really love those quotes there. Now on to Jeremy Hayward, lecturer in education at the UCL Institute of Education. Jeremy has lectured on the teaching of controversial issues and the promotion of fundamental British values at UCL, an institute for education, the world's top ranked university institution for education. Jeremy is here to talk about how, how schools can approach the topics we're talking about today and we will have a short interactive session that we're all very much looking forward to. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Lily. Uh, yes, so I'm Jeremy Hayward. I'm a former teacher and I now work at the Institute of Education uh, where thousands of people every year come to train to be teachers and we also research education. And one of the issues we're looking at is how schools address the issue of extremism. So I wanna talk very briefly about extremism and then ask you all some questions. So as Sarah was saying, I mean, there, is no sim there is no easy definition of extremism, but uh, most extremist ways of thinking are centered around a hatred of difference. And that could be different religion, different gender, different sexuality, different skin color. Now, all of us encounter difference every day and it's fine. In fact, you know, I think this is one of the things that makes life interesting and, and, and worth living. However, some people do start to see difference as a threat and it can become a form of hatred. And it could be a hatred of one form of difference or it could be a hatred of anyone that thinks differently or looks differently to them. Now, as people get drawn into these hateful ways of thinking, they start to see the world increasingly just in terms of us and them. And that's where sort of hateful thoughts become quite worrying and can become quite dangerous. But this, of course, doesn't happen by itself. People get drawn into these ways of thinking by others and increasingly online. And I think it's a big question for society, which is how can we stop people getting drawn in to these hateful and extremist ways of thinking? And of course, education has to be one of the answers. Uh, 
Uh, and that's what we're looking at to find out what schools are currently doing at the moment. Now, if we could get some uh, slides up, please, Katie. Uh, I thought I'd ask you some questions. For this, you're going to need your mobile phones and you're going to need to type in the word Slido to any reputable search engine and or just type in slido.com on your phone. Uh, and it should immediately ask you for sort of an entry code, and it's 911-911-SUMMIT, S-U-M-M-I-T. So if you type that into your phone, uh, and then immediately you should land on a page. That often there's a, a choice between Q&A and poll. You have to click poll on there. So if, I've given you a, a while to do that, but it's 911 summit And if we can go to the first poll question, please, Katie. So now I'm going to point out, this isn't part of our research, okay? Uh, it, it's entirely up to you whether you take part. Uh, we're not going to use this for anything uh, else. It's entirely anonymous as well. We're not recording, we have no way of recording anyone's uh, particular answers here. So the first question I'm interested in, and we'll, we'll get these answers later uh, from the poll, is have you encountered hateful ideas online? Now, it's not just one person saying something nasty to someone else, but you know you can sense there's a real hatred of a particular group of people. Have you encountered that online? So I want you to answer yes a lot, quite often, once or twice or never. And it's just interesting to see how prevalent your experiences are on social media in different formats to whether you've encountered particularly hateful ideas online. Okay, so I'm giving you a few seconds to answer that. And if we can go to the next question, please. So the next question, which should appear on your phones is, have you discussed ideas related to differences in your classroom? Now, I, I and by discussed, I mean discussed, because often teachers, they're quite busy and lessons can be teacher led and the teacher might say things about, you know, these are your human rights, copying them down. But I'm interested, have you had honest and open discussions about how you all feel about differences of differences of gender and sexuality. Have you had those discussions in your classroom? Because research shows one of the best ways of making people tolerant of difference is if you hear different views and you're exposed to different ways of living and being. So have a quick answer of that quite a few times, once or twice or never. So I'm interested to find out how much you do discuss difference in the classroom. The next question is, uh, it's an open question here. Is this the business of schools? Should schools address the issue of hateful and extremist ideas? Is this the business of schools? I mean, there's a lot to get through. You're all preparing for exams and I appreciate that. So I'm just asking you an open question. Is this the role of schools? Yes, maybe, no, not sure. Now, if you're not answering on these on your phone or you're not able to access it, it might be that you come to these questions with your teacher or perhaps if you're watching this on a video later, these are good questions to perhaps discuss in the class. And can we have the final uh, question, please? Yes, I just want to talk about this before you answer. Are most students in your school respectful of difference? Now, there's always going to be some things that you hear. Uh, one person might say something here and there, but I'm talking overall. The people in the school, are they respectful of difference? And I know there's lots of differences. There's difference of gender, of sexuality, of religion, of ethnicity, uh, of ability and disability. Are they respectful? of difference. Yes, most are, some are respectful, not many are respectful or not sure. Okay, so that was my final question. Uh, you can click on the Q&A now on the same uh, Slido poll and ask us questions as well, but I'm gonna uh, hand back at this point to Lily. Brilliant, thanks so much, Jeremy. We'll see those results of the Slido later. So we now have our final speaker, Sir Simon Sharma, who is a distinguished historian, writer, and broadcaster, who has written numerous books and documentaries on art, history, and literature for BBC Two. And awards for his work include an Emmy, the NCR Nonfiction Prize, the National Book Critics Guild Award, and the WH Smith Literary Award, amongst many others. Really looking forward to hear from Simon now. Hello, I'm Sir Simon Sharma talking to you from the wonderful tidiness of my study where I write my books and television programs and newspaper columns. And it's a pleasure talking to you about the important work that the 9-11 Foundation does. Now I say a pleasure to young friends, but it isn't 
a simple pleasure, is it, of course, because I live in New York. This is where um, I do all this writing. And I was in New York on 9-11. My son, who was then, I think, about 15, um, was at school. And I remember going to pick him up. And he and all his friends were just extraordinarily bewildered, um, as anybody your age would be, about the sheer force of hatred that produced the atrocity, the catastrophe of 9-11. Um, and left its mark forever, really, on the world and certainly on this part of the world. And it's very important to remember that even though that mass murder was done in the name of a particular religion, the full tragedy was that the people in Windows on the World, the people in the World Trade Center, the people who died in that terrible incineration were of extraordinary number of languages and religions and nationalities. It was an attack on the right to be different, on what a good friend of mine just recently deceased, the good the the Rabbi Lord Sachs, called the dignity of difference. And if you think about it, your generation, mine too, for that matter, old codgers like me, but your generation in particular, faces two very special problems. One is the serious degradation of the ecosystem of the environment of the planet. That's the most important problem of all. But the second problem is the profound difference between two kinds of people who make up the world. Those who only want to live with people who look like them, sound like them, pray like them, dress like them, cook like them, who want simply to be live their life inside their own tribe. And then the other kind of people, of which number you, I'm sure, and certainly number me, who want to share the neighbourhood. And in some ways, the two problems are connected. We have so many problems, like the environment, like the pandemic, that we can't afford to be intolerant. Uh, intolerance, after all, is about separation. It's about closing yourself off to other people's experience. And what we need more than anything, and the 9-11 Foundation and its educational curriculum are committed to, is teaching connection. It was an English writer, E.M. Forster, who wrote an essay with the famous phrase, only connect. And more than ever, we realise we're all on one lifeboat together in this little planet, the pale blue dot called the Earth. And we need connection. We need community. We need to restore in an age of enraged difference, really, and demonizing each other. We need to restore a sense of common humanity, a sense of common, uh, a common purpose, the dignity of difference, respect to each other's beliefs and right to speak. And that's what the 9-11 Foundation does. I wish it well with all my heart. And I wish you well with all my heart. And uh, hope you'll be committed to the cause I've been talking about. Bye-bye. Thank you, Simon, for highlighting why we need a more tolerant world and why combating extremism is so very important. So... Now that we've heard from all our wonderful speakers, it's time to move on to the interactive question and answer session. Um, so aware that you've put some great questions into the Slido and we'll be, we'll be getting to those in this next part. Don't forget you can continue to add your questions um, on the same Slido that you were on previously for the poll. So, panelists. We've heard your interventions and now we have some questions. The first question is, what is 9-11 and why should we be learning about it? Who would like to take that question? Just jump in. Jeremy, go for it. Thank you. Well, 9-11 uh, refers to uh, a, a date uh, of uh, the 11th of September. Um, so it's, it's simply the date and it's a series of terrorist attacks for uh, four planes and nearly 3,000 people dying on that morning. So it refers to that particular uh, terrible attack. Uh, why is it important to learn about? Well, I mean, terrorism has always been a part of, of history and, and continues to be, but that represented a seismic change, uh, you know, a, a massive event. And it, it 
signalled for the world big changes, you know, little things from changes to airport security that stay with us today, but also big geopolitical changes were, 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 were started after that, different wars and campaigns were started. So, it, it, you know, it's, we still live to an extent in, in a post 9-11 world and we're all still, it's important that we understand how these changes came about. So I think it's, it's an important event to learn about. Does anyone have any tips about how we can educate young people at school on these issues in ways that aren't boring or patronizing, um, but ways that we can all try to understand and learn from these sorts of events? Nikki? Yes, I think, I think actually having given these speeches to various uh, younger people, the um, response from them was extremely positive. And I got people coming up to me afterwards, like young people coming up and thanking me for doing that. And I think maybe it is a hard thing to discuss it, obviously, for everyone. But having been there, I know the impact it's had on my children and and on the fam and the family life. I mean, we have a wonderful family life now, but it's it's always there. It's never going away. So I think it is extremely important for young people to engage in listening and discussing these big issues. Uh, and I'd also add that, you know, how do you do this in ways that aren't sort of patronizing or so? So, you know, often it, it shouldn't necessarily always be teacher led. It's good to hear from other people uh, and not just ease about these events. The more you hear people's stories, their narratives, their experiences, the more you are exposed to difference. It humanizes other people and it makes us more appreciative of difference. And we stop to see the world just as in terms of big groupings. We see them as a, individuals with a, with a shared humanity and shared sort of aims and wishes in life. So I think getting talking classrooms as much as possible, getting outside speakers in who can come and give their experiences so that you're exposed to difference is a really important and vital way. Yes. Brilliant. And now we have a question from the Slido that has over 124 uh, thumbs up. So everyone really wants to hear the answer to this one. And it's a very important one as well. Uh, the question is, do you think that the 9-11 attack increased Islamophobia? And I guess a follow up would be, and how do we start to tackle that in society to combat this hatred? I'll answer that question, Lily. Um, I think undoubtedly that was the case. It, you know, so three, almost 3,000 people were killed. Uh, it's there's those 19 Islamist extremists um, had tried to use the name of, of religion, my religion, um, to justify their attacks. Um, and a lot of people did experience uh, anti-Muslim hatred and Islamophobia. I remember I was a student at university at that time. Um, I certainly experienced anti-Muslim hatred. Um, and I think that's what the, the consequences of extremism is that it doesn't just end on the attack itself and the devastation it causes then. It's as Jeremy said, there are ramifications that happen. Um, and we saw how a lot of people, a lot of Muslims were attacked um, after 9-11. We saw how Sikhs were uh, attacked in the US because they were mistakenly identified as, as Muslims. So unfortunately, um, it did create uh, a climate of hatred against Muslims. And in one sense, that's what Islamist extremists wanted to achieve. You know, they want to create a division between the West um, and, and Islam and, the Mus and Muslims that live in the West. And by these types of attacks, that's what happens. It fuels hatred against Muslims. We've seen how Islamist terrorist attacks have helped to fuel the far right in this country. So undoubtedly it has, it has done that. And I think this is why programs like this are really important. And one of the things that I've spent a lot of my time doing is going into schools and helping to teach the difference between Islam as a religion, as a faith, which is practiced by millions of people all across the world who despise ISIS, many of whom are being murdered by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other Islamist terrorists, but distinguishing Islam as religion, as a faith, to this perverse 20th century modern political religious ideology. And understanding that difference between Islam and Islamist extremism is really critical. And I think, again, and using that through the power of education it is really, really important. And when people understand that, understand, and, and again, a lot of things can be, and there are many ideologies 
ideologies, once they become politicized um, and once they become a, a, an extreme political ideology, that's what extremists hang on to. But it is a perversion. And it's really important that we recognize that in the battle against Islamist extremism, unless we have Muslims on side, we won't be able to win that battle. And many you know, experts, many in the US, many in this country, many governments and, and, and world leaders recognize that. So we have to ensure that we work together. This is not about saying it's that this is what Muslims have to do. It's about saying we together as a common humanity stand up and fight against Islamist extremism and all forms of extremism together. Mm. Certainly. Um, we're just, just to let the people in the audience know, we're going slightly over time um, and we'll be going until 12 p.m. Um, so if you need to jump off, we understand it. there'll be a recording, but if you can stay with us, that would be brilliant um, to hear some more questions and answers as well as to see the results of the Slido. Um, so the next question, again, from, from the students is, about extremism and asking how people become extremists and how we can tackle that. I'm guessing very much through education, but it'd be great to hear a bit more. Who would like to take that? Jeremy? Um, I, I, there's no easy answer to this and I'm actually not an expert on this. And uh, when we use the term extremist, that, that in, encounters a lot of things, you know, not just the people who commit violent uh, acts of terrorism, but also other, other sort of acts of hate crime as well. Uh, but we've seen, uh, as both uh, Sarah and I uh, argued, that a key element is, is in starting to see the world in terms of differences and developing it, some forms of sort of hatred or fear or threat of a particular kind of difference. So that can be one trigger. Uh, there are other factors that research has shown can lead to it. So it's often people are sort of drawn into these ideas by particular people they may look up to or others and wanting to fit into a group. That's another uh, aspect that, that can lead people into this, uh, as well as there can be other trigger events that uh, have seen. So sometimes if people feel alienated and they don't fit in or don't feel welcomed in a particular group or society, that might then make them sort of resent society or look for another group of people that also resent society or particular group in a certain way. So those are some of the factors, but I don't think there's a, a simple psychological explanation of why people get drawn in to extremist ideologies? Yeah, that's it. It's a really good question. It's the kind of question where someone can go and write a PhD thesis on, and we certainly haven't got time to, to answer it in the, in the short time we have, but it is an important question. We obviously, as part of the work in, in the commission, have, have published all sorts of papers looking at the causes, the, the factors that drive extremism, um, and there is no one single profile of individual who gets drawn into extremism or terrorism. That's, that's the one thing a lot of academic debate will agree on. Um, and so there are lots of different factors. There are things at an individual level, um, and Jeremy's mentioned some of those things, if, if your lack of support system, a lack of a, a network, a, a lack of a, a kind of a family support system that can provide and guide young people but there are also societal impacts as well there are societal issues and concern I mean one of the things that I see regularly is how there are extremist groups and individuals who seek to propagate their ideology they seek to normalize it in society they seek to mainstream it and if you if you imagine extremist views and activity on the fringes of our society what extremists seek to do is whether it's through social media, whether it's through holding events in, in, our, in our towns and cities, what they seek to do is to mainstream it, to, to recruit more people to their cause, to propagate it uh, to, to whole, whole groups of people because they want more and more people to buy into their divisive, hate-filled ideological worldview. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of extremists know that trying to radicalize young people in particular is, is a really important part of their tactics. So there are, there are lots and lots of different push and pull factors, societal factors, individual factors, um, and, and no, no one individual is going to be motivated in the same way as perhaps another person. There will be different factors. So it is very, very complex. But I think, again, recognizing how what extremists want to do, which is to mainstream their ideology and propagate it and recruit it and seek to, to target us, understanding that is important when we are wanting to counter it so that we can assure our approach to countering it will be effective. Really brilliant to hear those answers and 
there, as you say, there's no one way that people get into extremism, but um, we need to understand those factors and realize there's no one profile of a person who gets drawn into extremism. The next question is somewhat of a follow-up um, in ways, and it's about why do you think it's important to challenge fake news and conspiracy theories on extremist events such as 9-11? Uh, I'm happy to speak a, a, a bit about this. Um, uh, and this is a growing problem. It's that so sometimes conspiracy theories, people get drawn in for different reasons. And then before you know it, it's a, it's a way that people get you into an extremist ideology. Uh, and I think it's important to combat it, particularly in education, because young people, without realizing it, actually can spread uh, uh, forms of misinformation. People can deliberately put out fake news or, or ideas, and people can click and share <clears throat> and propagate. And it's only through the propagation of those ideas that they live and thrive. So I think there's a massive uh, role for education, but for all of us to stop and think whenever we see an item or something that you can click on to slow down and think, sorry, what is this? Is this a credible source? Is this a real story? Should I be sharing this? I think there's a massive role uh, because we've seen that many of these conspiracy theories act as gateways into extremist ideologies. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what Jeremy has said. I think it's one of the most pressing challenges facing um, our generation, our time today. There's always been conspiracy theories and fake news throughout society. But I think it's the, the, the scale and reach, particularly through social media, which is really concerning. And one of the things that I see time and again is how the use of fake news and disinformation and conspiracy theories is a key tactic employed by extremists. If you, I'll give you an example. I mean, the, the, the COVID pandemic, we have seen and we've published a report showing how there are neo-Nazi neo organizations um, who are saying uh, Jews are to be blamed for the coronavirus and spreading anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, inciting hatred against Jews, saying we should attack Jews. Now, again, if you're making false claims and spreading conspiratorial theories, there will be some people who will read that, who will believe it, and then go and do something violent, um, maybe result in attack in a synagogue and so forth. And that's what we tend to see time and time again. The damage of conspiracy theories, not only to individuals, but to whole communities, to places of worship, but fundamentally to our democracy, I think is, is a huge challenge of our time. And it is there to erode trust in our democratic institutions, to trust with our, in our teachers, in, in our schools. Um, and it's, it's a really big problem. And we can see now how governments across the world are trying to combat COVID-19 vaccine conspiracy theories as well. And again, if we don't challenge those, if we don't challenge those theories, the impact that's going to have on people's lives is going to be devastating. So it is such a key issue. And what I would just say is, and I know a lot of schools are doing this, but teaching young people about the importance of critical thinking and, and understanding and developing critical thinking skills, I think is absolutely essential. We, all of us, it doesn't matter whether you're young or adults, we all come across all sorts of fake news, particularly through social media. And it's really important that we have the, the right skills to be able to equip us as to what is fact and what is fiction. Indeed, and I've seen that Twitter, for example, uh, before you reshare something, before you retweet, it, it asks you to check out the source that it's come from before you just share um, without knowing the facts and the source and, and where those facts may be coming from, which is a step in the right direction, but we, need, we do need much more. We need to employ those critical thinking skills. Um, uh, we're gonna move to the final question now. Uh, which is, what would you want to be one of the key messages for young people to take away from today and from your experiences? So perhaps, Nikki, could you kick us off on this one? Yes, I, I hope that young people will absorb what you have said today and uh, and think, think more carefully, just slow down a bit in life and think carefully about the decisions that we all make and what and why we make them be you know look inwardly too and why do we make these decisions why did we make that silly decision to do whatever i hope that they young people will listen to your very eloquent speeches 
going to do a round round table then. So Sarah, Sarah, next, what's the key message you want young people to take away from today? I think it's just recognizing that the the power that you have, that, you know, all, all of us, it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, but we have the power to either be part of the solution or to be part of the problem. Um, and, you know, you, you're right, Lily, about saying we shouldn't be sharing information if we're not sure about the source. We have a responsibility of not pressing that retweet button. That very simple act is making a difference. Um, but, you know, I really do believe in young people and the power that they have in standing up and making a difference. I've met many young people, thousands of people over the years, young people who care passionately about equality and and human rights who recognize the harm that extremism causes. And I think you can be great flag bearers for speaking out against extremism. Um, so, you know, I, I, and, you know, we look at people like Greta Thunberg and, and the impact she's had on the issue of climate change. So I, I really feel this is a mantle that has to be carried on by younger people and, and future generations. And so I, I really do hope that you will carry that flag and, and work to, that we all live in a world that respects equality, human rights, difference, um, and counter, and that we all work together to counter extremism. Uh, and I'd just add these excellent words there, just that, you know, we're all trying to make our way in life and our mind has a tendency to classify and label things, but it's to try and just see the common humanity in, in everyone. We're all, we're all in this together. And the more you speak to people that are different from you and hear their life stories, and the more you see the, the commonality that unites us all. And particularly on Human Rights Day, and those human rights are there to try and protect everyone so everyone can have a level of dignity and respect as we all make our way through life. Excellent closing words there. I love that emphasis on this common humanity and that Yes, the more we share our life with people who look different to us, speak different to us, um, come from different places and, and so much more, that the more tolerant a society we will live in um, and really taking that flag forward uh, for the next generation. Thanks so much to all the speakers. Um, so, so that is the end of the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much for submitting your questions and for attending. Apologies that we couldn't get to more of them today but hopefully we can answer some of those in the follow-up that will come following this webinar. But if you do have unanswered questions, these are really the kinds of questions you can ask your teachers about, your family, your friends. Keep that conversation going and really don't be, a sca don't be scared or afraid to ask questions about these tricky topics such as 9-11 and other terrorist attacks. I really hope you've learned a lot from this summit, the Since 9-11 Summit and that you will ask your teachers to access the Since 9-11 programs on the website so you can carry on learning and discussing um, so you'll be equipped to challenge radicalization and extremism in the years ahead, wherever you see it, to make our world a better, more peaceful, more tolerant world for the future. I'm now gonna pass over to Jeremy to get the poll results that you've all been waiting for. And then Jeremy will pass us over to Professor Martin Mills from UCL to talk directly to your teachers. Many thanks to all who've attended today. And now over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, uh, Katie, if it's possible to get the results of the, uh, the questions I asked earlier. And again, this isn't um, scientific research there. Um, so we can see, there we are, have you encountered hateful ideas online? We can see that 36% quite often, and if you add that with once or twice, we get 68% of people have, uh, Oh, yes, a lot, actually most. So only 8% have never. So that's, and I think that's a, a finding that is replicated in wider literature that actually it's, it's becoming more increasingly common that people encounter hateful ideas online. Next slide, please, Katie. Have you discussed issues related to difference in your classroom? Oh, and that's good to see. Uh, that's good to see that once or twice is winning, but quite a few times uh, is uh, also there. So that's 83% have discussed uh, ideas related to difference in your classroom. And I think that's good to see. Next one. Should schools address the issue of hateful extremism? Ah, so we've got overwhelming 83% of people saying yes, 9% uh, maybe, 5% no. Um, and I would agree. I think there are debates to say that schools should focus on knowledge, but I think increasingly it, it's hard to ignore the fact that schools are there. Well, part of the aim is to, to prepare people and for life that they're going to live. Okay, uh, so the next one. Uh, 
Are most students in your school respectful of difference? Uh, so we've got some are respectful there. And yes, those two together then, I think that's quite an encouraging sign that most uh, people in school, and I think people are generally born respecting of difference and, and not even seeing difference often. So it's only as people get older and perhaps listen to other people in, in negative ways that they may change their mind. Uh, we've got a few 16% saying uh, not many are respectful, but most of you, uh, it's nice to see that schools are respectful of difference, the pupils in the schools. So thank you for those questions. I'm going to hand over now to the final words uh, to a colleague of mine at the Institute of Education, Professor Martin Mills. Thanks, Jeremy. So I'm director of the Centre for Teachers and Teaching Research that's currently conducting um, some work with since 9-11 about resources for teachers in, in schools. And part of my role here is to, to thank the, the speakers today, Lily, Nikki, um, Sarah, Jeremy, Simon. It's been wonderful to hear your perspectives on these um, very important topics. Whilst you were talking, I was thinking, I'm speaking today from what is Jagara and Tarabul land in Brisbane, Australia, Aboriginal land that has never been um, ceded over which there was no treaty. And it was, if you know anything of the history of Australia, one of the very first acts was an act of terror when um, when a, an Aboriginal man was shot at Botany Bay. The, the shield with the bullet hole sits in the um, London Museum, not far from my office in London. The human rights that still um, experienced, lack of human rights experienced by many Aboriginal people in Australia is still of significant concern. I was a history um, English teacher in Australia and my daughter is a history teacher here. And we talked both about those issues and I showed her the video, the since 9-11 video um, on the weekend. And we talked both about how when we were teaching around issues that are hugely controversial, issues which are very sensitive, like terrorism and extremism, how much we need really high quality resources to work with. And so what we've been trying to do with since 9-11 is find out what teachers need. So we have a, a survey that is, there's a link to that survey on your Eventbrite email. So if you, for the teachers, if you could go after this um, webinar is finished, and please, if you haven't already done so, complete that survey, because it will be really helpful for us. So thank you to both the students and the teachers for attending today. I think it's been a wonderful event from which I've learnt a lot um, and which I hope will be a resource and something that you will keep discussing for some time after this webinar finishes. Thank you very much.